days run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have a resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over TCC. Welcome to our online service. My name is Sean, and this is Tim, and we've got a few announcements for you. That's right. There's quite a bit coming up around TCC in the next few weeks, and so we're going to give you a few of the highlights today before we continue with our service. Yeah, but before we get to that, I just want to take a second to welcome those of you who are tuning in for the first time. We are so glad you're here, and we hope that you feel right at home here at Tulare Community Church. If you'd like to find out more about the life and ministry of TCC, be sure to fill out the connect form on our website. We'd also love to connect with you and tell you about all the exciting stuff coming up. That's right. For example, next Sunday, August 7, is our final week of our summer service schedule for our in-person services. And starting on August 14, we will return to our regular schedule. That's two services on the main campus and one at East Campus. Yep, and also coming up, we'll have a congregational meeting on Monday, August 15, regarding the denominational affiliation process. So that meeting is going to be held at 6 p.m. in the Activity Center on our main campus. Child care will be provided. So please do everything in your power to be at that meeting if you are a committed disciple of TCC. Yeah, and there are more things coming up in a few weeks down the road, like 
our next hymn sing, our midweek kickoff and car show, but we'll bring you all the details for those as we get closer. If you want to read more about what's coming up, be sure that you are subscribed to the weekly email, which comes out every Thursday. You can do that by contacting our office anytime. Yeah, well, that's probably enough for today. So thanks for sticking with us. We're going to throw it back down to the stage as we continue with our time of worship. Thanks so much for tuning in today, and let's praise the Lord together. Take it away, team.
Hey there, TCC. My name is Shane. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, please open up your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 20. We are continuing in our sermon series on kingdom parables. And today we have a really interesting one. Uh, Jesus is going to tell us about workers in a vineyard. And it's a really challenging parable in several ways. Last week, we looked at a really simple, straightforward parable. It was easy to understand, but it was also perhaps hard to hear. And this parable, too, is challenging in that respect. This parable might be hard to hear. It's bothersome. It's irksome. If you empathize with some of the characters in this parable, it will probably violate your sense of fairness. This parable can be hard to hear. But it can also be just hard to understand. Uh, what's the point of it? What is Jesus driving at? Well, the first step in tackling this is to read it. So let's do that. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So what do we make of this? It's a challenging parable, and you can tell that it's a challenging parable just by comparing and contrasting different Bible commentaries. What is the lesson of this parable? Well, here's one commentary from Dr. Warren Baker. He explains it this way. Those who signed a contract to earn a dinar for 12 hours of work set their own price for their own work, and that is what they receive. Those who do what they are called upon by the Lord to do and leave the reward to Him will always be rewarded far more than if they set the worth of their own labor. This is the principal lesson in this parable. Okay, so that's one idea. Do what God calls you to do and let God set the reward because what you think you want, what you think you should be rewarded, is far less than what God's grace has to offer or something to that effect. Others, however, suggest that this parable is about equality of Jews and Gentiles. Matthew Henry's commentary puts it this way. The direct object of this parable seems to be to show that though the Jews were first called into the vineyard, at length the gospel should be preached to the Gentiles and they should be admitted to equal privileges and advantages with the Jews. Benson's commentary concurs with that idea, saying, The Gentiles last called and last in advantages and privileges, not having been favored in that respect as the Jews were, and despised and looked down upon with contempt by the Jews, shall be first shall more readily and in far greater numbers embrace the gospel than the Jews and shall far exceed them in knowledge and wisdom, holiness and usefulness, and make abundantly greater progress than they in true religion. Okay, that one might be a little too anti-Jewish for my liking, but the Bible does talk about how salvation comes first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, and it does talk about equality in Christ for Jew and Gentile, and the Apostle Paul tackles the heartburn that might cause to some of the Jews. He says in Romans, what then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. You can see how that might apply to this parable. The Jews were there first, and they worked and worked and worked, and they get the same reward as the Gentiles? 
Maybe, that's one interpretation. However, Barnes notes on the Bible doesn't equate it to Jews and Gentiles, but sees it more broadly as God's favor on certain individuals. He puts it this way, So the last shall be first. This is the moral or scope of the parable. Many that, in the order of time, are brought last into the kingdom shall be first in the rewards. Higher proportionate rewards shall be given to them than to others. To all justice shall be done. To all to whom the rewards of heaven are promised, they shall be given. Nothing shall be withheld that was promised. If among this number who are called into the kingdom, I choose to raise some to stations of distinguished usefulness and to confer on them special talents and higher rewards, I injure no other one. They shall enter heaven as was promised. If amid the multitude of Christians, I choose to signalize such men as Paul and Martin and Brainerd and Spencer and Summerfield to appoint some of them to short labor, but to wide usefulness and raise them to signal rewards, I injure not the great multitude of others who live long lives less useful and less rewarded. All shall reach heaven and all shall receive what I promise to the faithful. Okay, so justice will be done to all. We will all reach heaven. However, some people have shorter lives, some longer. Some serve Christ for a long time. Some serve Christ for a short time. But God will reward proportionately based on the kind of work done that he called us to do in this life. An example he gave was Paul. Maybe a shorter life in service to Christ, but his short labor was wide and useful, and so proportionally, he gives a greater reward. All right, I'm not quite sure I buy into that one because the complaint in the parable is not simply the hours of the work, but the difficulty of the work as well. They said, you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Not only did they work more hours, but their work was harder and more unpleasant. I don't think that quite fits. I mean, Paul maybe had a shorter life than some in service to Christ, but it certainly wasn't easier work or more pleasant. If you look at what happens to Paul and the apostles in Scripture, I think they very much face the heat of the day, and I think they shall be rewarded for it. Of course, Zondervan commentary argues that the parable is not about work or reward at all. They make this statement, The parable is a lesson on gratitude and motivation in service, not about salvation or gaining eternal life, because salvation is not earned by works. Nor is the parable about rewards for service, because God will reward believers differently according to their service. It's not about Jews and Gentiles. It's not about your work. It's not about heaven. It's not about reward. It's about gratitude and your heart's motivation. Okay. So are you thoroughly confused yet? My point in bringing all of this up is to demonstrate that this is a challenging parable, even to understand. And I'm not going to be claiming to have the definitive interpretation of this parable, but I do think there are clear biblical truths expressed in Scripture that are found in this parable, and that's what I want to look at today. Now, I do think to properly understand this parable, we should probably back up a bit and see it in greater context. So let's glance back at chapter 19. We have the account here of the rich young man. This man comes to Jesus. He says to him, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells him, you know the law of Moses, just obey all of it and you'll have eternal life, which is true. But according to scripture, we can't obey all of it. We don't obey all of God's law. We are all law breakers. And James tells us that if we break one part of the law, you break the whole thing. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. And Paul tells us that the purpose of God's law is to show us our sinfulness. Romans says this, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. 
For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. But this rich young man doesn't see what James and Paul see. He doesn't see that he's a lawbreaker. He tells Jesus that he has obeyed the law since he was a child, so what else should he do? He thinks he can earn his salvation. He thinks his work will earn him eternal life. And so Jesus corrects him. He demonstrates for him just how impossible it is to earn your salvation. He gives the rich young man for him an impossible task. He says, sell everything, give it all away, and you'll have treasure in heaven. The rich young man can't do that. It's an impossible task for him, and so he walks away. And then it says this, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. It is impossible for man to earn salvation. Salvation is not from the work of man, it is from the work of God. Then, very next verse, Peter says this, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? That is a question in response to this interaction with the rich young ruler. Jesus told the rich young man, if you leave everything and follow me, you'll have treasure in heaven. And Peter goes, oh, we've left everything, we've done that, so what can we expect? And that is the question that Jesus is answering that leads us into this parable. Here's the setup. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last." and many who are last will be first. For, that's a continuation of the thought, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. Okay, so Jesus is answering a question that Peter asked in response to the rich young ruler. So I think you see two concepts here. You will be rewarded for what you have done, but it's still impossible for man to earn eternal life. Jesus immediately reassures Peter, yes, there is a reward. You will be rewarded, but don't get it twisted. Fundamentally, the kingdom of heaven is not about what we have done. It is about what God has done for us. It's grace, not our works. It's grace, not our labor. These workers that are snatched up at the 11th hour, they receive wages that they didn't earn. They receive payment that they don't deserve. It's nothing but generosity, compassion, and grace. And it's very bothersome, isn't it? I think it's meant to be. It's violating something ingrained in us, a sense of justice that you should get what you deserve. But Christianity is about grace. That's the entire premise, that we deserve hell. But God, in his grace, he provides a way so that we don't get what we deserve. That's the premise. So why then do we have this narrow sense of justice? Why does this parable rub us the wrong way? Why do we have a moral framework that seems in contrast to Christianity? Well, the answer, I think, is so that we can understand Christianity. Uh, think again about the law, what Paul was saying about the law that we just read. God gives us the law. He impresses it upon us so that we recognize sin as sin, right? Paul said, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. It's meant to bring life, but in sinful people, it produces the conditions of sin and thereby shows us that we're sinners and sinful by nature. And so, too, God impresses upon us this sense of justice, of getting what you deserve in order to understand the concept of grace. In order to see grace as grace, you have to see that you don't deserve it, because that is grace by definition. 
In order for God to demonstrate his grace, he instills in us this concept of getting what you deserve because that is the only way to recognize grace as grace and to be overjoyed by grace. And yet, even though as Christians we proclaim that we deserve hell and are saved by grace alone, we can still be bothered by God's grace. Like these workers in the field, the the issue of God's grace doesn't bother us when it's directed to us. It only bothers us when it's directed to others, when we see the blessings of others, when we see how God has been gracious to others. And we'll say, what about me? And we'll point to our work, to our labor. Lord, haven't I been serving you? Haven't I been faithful? I serve at the church, I I read my Bible, I pray, I tithe, I care for the widow, I care for the orphan. Why am I alone and other people have spouses? Those other people, they get their dream job, why can't I? Or, Or why are we struggling with fertility when so many other people have children? Or why can't I get a clean bill of health? You know, other people uh, don't even have to worry about paying the mortgage. Are you bothered by God's grace? What is it exactly that you think you deserve? What do you think you're owed? You know, God does not mistreat us. He, He is perfectly just and wrongs no one, and that's emphasized in the parable. But what's more is that our sense of blessings uh, may not be in alignment with God's. You can be happy and healthy and wealthy and think God has really blessed me. You know, he's been so gracious to me, which is true. Those Those are good things, blessings received in gratitude. But what is the greater blessing? What does Jesus constantly say and says in our passage and in this parable? The first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus says these famous words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. God clearly thinks about blessing and reward in very different terms than we do. Again, this parable is instigated because of a question by Peter about reward. So the first thing I think to see about the parable is to remind us that it's still all about grace. Everything ultimately that we inherit in the kingdom of God is not by what we have done, but by God's sovereign grace. But it also reinforces what Jesus constantly tells us, that his economy and our economy are not the same. And when it comes to reward in the kingdom of God, the first will be last and the last will be first. There are two concepts taught in scripture. Number one, you are not saved by your works. That is impossible for man. You are saved by grace through faith in Christ. However, number two, your work and labor will still be rewarded. First Corinthians, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. It says in Hebrews, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. It says in Revelation, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. The reward is according to what you have done and reward is not uniform. Some people's work is better than others. Listen to Corinthians. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. Right? It's still what Jesus has done. It's still grace. But if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. 
If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. There's a difference there. In fact, the statement, the last will be first and the first will be last, indicates a hierarchy. It's not uniformity. And Jesus, when asked about being the greatest in the kingdom of God, doesn't say there's no such thing. He says this, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. You want to be first? You got to be last. You want to be great? You have to be a slave of all. Now, I think for a lot of us, we, we hear that, and we can be very pragmatic about it. We can think, you know, I, I don't care if I'm least in the kingdom as long as I'm in. You know, people might have more than me, might be more rewarded than me, but it's not like I'm going to be envious of them. I'm going to be perfect. So I will perfectly rejoice for them and honor them. And heaven will be indescribably joyous and perfect for all of us. So what difference does it make if someone is rewarded more? It's not going to bother you. If it bothers you, if it upsets you that some people are rewarded more, then heaven is not perfect and neither are you. But that seems to be a problem though, right? Because if I'm not going to care about status in heaven, but I care about status now, well then why not get it now? Isn't that the smarter play? Uh, be first here because last in the kingdom is still inexpressibly good. Why should we strive? Why should we become least? Why should we be slaves to all? What does it really get us? You know, how, how can you possibly be rewarded more than perfection? And heaven is perfect. So what do we say to that? Well, I think this parable helps us there. Uh, they all receive the same, yes, but they don't receive it in the same way. Now, here's a question. Which group of workers or laborers loves the landowner the most? Certainly not the first group. What about the second group? Uh, probably more so, but, but clearly the last group would love the landowner more and receive the same gift with far greater joy. The Westminster Catechism question and answer number one says this, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's heaven. The work and labor that we do conditions us to glorify and enjoy God, and that is proportional to our reward. In the kingdom of heaven, all of our cups will be overflowing with the joy and love of God. Yes, it's the same in that way, but some cups will be deeper and bigger. And the love and joy that they experience in glorifying God will be greater because they were last. But here's the thing. That reward doesn't start in heaven. It comes to perfection and fulfillment in heaven, but it starts when we come to saving faith in Christ. And from that moment on, we work and strive as Christ's servants. And as we do, we recognize his grace as grace more and more. And that in turn deepens our joy more and more. See, the proper heart of a Christian will never seek to be first here. And that's not because we've done the math. It's not pragmatic. It's not, oh, I'm going to go last because then I'll get a greater reward. I'm going to be a slave to all and a servant and lower myself because it's going to pay off one day. No, it's because what our hearts long for isn't found in any other direction. It's because the lowly state is where we find Christ. And he is our reward. He always has been. And we are simply chasing what we love. And in this world, that brings us lower. But in God's kingdom, it raises us up. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fierce.
is drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Friends, it is by God's grace that we enter into eternal life. But he who is last will be first, and our work will be shown for what it is. Hear this promise from our vineyard owner. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Go in peace.